Welcome to Mastara for something I've been putting off for a while. And considering my workload lately, it wasn't that hard to put it off. People love dinosaurs. People really love dinosaurs. How else can you explain the success of Jurassic Park after six movies of decreasing quality? Seriously, Locust? You're going to make a movie about dinosaurs and the threat is Locusts? Dinos have been a staple of D&D almost since the start. They had a multi-page spread in the Mastara manual and have been constantly updated in each edition. But where do they fit in Mastara? Well, quite a few places. More than a few. Even when there shouldn't be dinosaurs somewhere, someone will find a reason to have a dinosaur. Time to find out why and where. I'm Mr. Welch, and open the door. Get on the floor. Everybody walk the dinosaur. This isn't going to be a complete breakdown of every single dinosaur that Mastara has rules for. Just assume it has all the dinosaurs, without exception. If you can think of a dinosaur, it's in Mastara. If it's close to a dinosaur like a Dimetrodon, it's in Mastara. Doesn't matter what era it's from. If it didn't exist with the other types of dinosaurs, it's still in Mastara. The rule of cool applies when it comes to the Thunder Lizards. So don't worry if a Tyrannosaurus and a Stegosaurus never existed at the same time. Here they will. Mastara lists 17 different dinosaurs by name across a staggering 15 books, with everything else listed as just a size and diet type of dinosaur. You've got large land carnivores, large land herbivores, small land carnivores, and so on. If you absolutely just have to have the newly discovered Hellboy dinosaur, aka the Regaloceratops, it's a large land herbivore. Just grab the general description, and you've got your big lizard. If you have to make it stand out, tweak the existing rules to fit your specific dinosaur. You're spoiled for choice, and they're easy to customize. You will have to watch out for several of the dinosaurs that have different rules depending on what book you're looking at. The Triceratops has rules in the Expert box set, which differ from those in the Hollow World box set. The Allosaurus also appears in both books, but are radically different in size, and they don't seem to be the same dinosaur. Ditto on the Stegosaurus, so you will need to pick which version of the Thagomizer you want to go with. That's an important selection when playing with dinosaurs. Please don't let the sacrifice of the late Thag Simmons go to waste. Fun fact, the tail spikes of the Stegosaurus have actually been named the Thagomizer from the Farside cartoon. Apparently it only had a name once Dan Larson gave it one, and all the paleontologists just went with it. That'll get you a point at bar trivia. There are a lot of fantasy dinosaurs scattered throughout, and some fantasy creatures that might be dinosaurs, depending on your DM's take on the large lizard creatures. The skin wing from the Shadow Elf book is suggested to be a dinosaur, or at least a cousin of theirs. The Loch Nahr from Saga of the Shadow Lord apparently is a large aquatic dinosaur of an unknown type, as is the late Clintest monster from Rockholm. The Rockholm lizard is speculated to be an older type of dinosaur, and possibly the ancestor of the lizardmen species and all the subspecies created from them. Dinosaurs tend to be found in lost world locations, which Mastara has in abundance. Lest we forget, the immortal Ka was a carnosaur that somehow developed sentience, though exactly which species he was initially is a mystery as Ka has made it his mission to keep species from going extinct. Even if a dinosaur type would die out, he safely tucks it away, either in the hollow world or on the last planet in the solar system, appropriately known as Ka. He stores the dinosaurs even if they don't fit in the local biosphere, or worse, makes things unbalanced. Just because an individual species of dinosaur doesn't mean it will thrive in the new location. Ka doesn't care. He wants to save them, even if they are dying, even if other creatures are more capable of survival. Now where do you find these dinosaurs? Well, literally all over the map, and below the map, and above the map. You're not going to see them in the more civilized areas, unless they're part of a zoo or private collection. Normally they're hidden away from populated regions, because they are tasty from what I can tell. This isn't the last Jurassic Park movie. Dinosaurs aren't going to be walking down the streets of Darakin City unless they're on a leash. Come to think of it, how are the dinosaurs still alive in the Jurassic Park universe? It's not like we can't spot them from a distance, and dinosaurs aren't that bulletproof. You think there'd be an agency devoted to removing dinosaurs, so we don't have raptors eating children and native species. Just saying, open season and no bag limit. The first spot we're off to is the Isle of Dread, to no one's surprise. The module introduced us to the concept of a lost world in D&D. The fact that it's not even a partially disguised stand-in for Skull Island makes it the most famous lost world. Here dinosaurs roam around openly, with herds of the larger ones walking around in the various plains. Overhead there's numerous pterosaurs of varying sizes. And in the jungles, you will face ambush predators or angry loners who don't like company. The natives have even domesticated a few, using them for pack or draft animals to help move heavy objects or in construction projects. If you need to capture a dinosaur, or possibly even buy one, then you need to head to the Isle of Dread. Bonus points of the Derekin or Minrathad character can set up a dino dealership for future customers. The nation of Karamari over in the Serpent Peninsula is secretive, with the country surrounded by dense jungle. The knowledge of its existence is a secret, and it's only known to their neighbors in Yavdalum. 
The nation has many dinosaurs, specifically ones that can thrive in dense jungles or swamps. If you want a tame dinosaur, this is the place to get one. That is, if the Karamari people tolerated visitors. The reason why they chose to live in the middle of a thick jungle was to avoid contact with all others. If you insist on staying for a visit, they have ways of convincing you it's time to go, in the form of Triceratops cavalry. Why bother with a lance when your mount sports three of them automatically? Yes, the Karamari has hundreds of Triceratops they have domesticated for their own use. No, they aren't going to share any of them with you. They might sell you a small discount elephant if they like you, but no dinosaurs for you. Then we get to the Hollow World, the one spot stop for all your dino needs. Here, the dinosaurs existed long before the immortals started shoving surface cultures into it. Everybody blames this on Ka, but he swears he didn't do it. He stashed all the dinos on the planet with his name on it. Regardless who left all the dinosaurs around, they are found in almost every nation and are a threat, boon, or annoyance depending on their location. Just about everybody views them as a menace and tries to drive them out. As most civilizations are Bronze Age in technology, moving a dinosaur weighing as much as a warship can be a little challenging. Nations that directly mention dinosaurs include the Cubit Nation, a race of foot and a half tall Amazons. They are considered prey, so they build their tree villages well above the reach of the dinosaurs. The Azcans hunt them for protection and have gotten quite good at it. Some Nithians have tamed smaller dinosaurs to use as mounds, but have driven out the larger ones. The Millennium Empire is mostly dinosaur-free, but they do share a border with Tanagoro and the Genites, meaning there's always going to be more. Oltecs settled in lands with few dinosaurs, as they have a hard time in the steep hills. They do have to deal with flyers and smaller versions of dinosaurs, but don't worry about the carnosaurs that plague other nations. The lands of the Tanagoro have a large number of dinosaurs, especially the meat-eaters that eat the herds of the aurochs found on the plains. Herbivores also dot the fields in large herds, and the people there have learned to avoid both. Only the colder climes lack dinosaurs, namely the Ice Veil and Black Lore Elves. Now that you know what the dinosaurs are and where to find them, what next? Well, for enterprising adventures, there's a lot of money to be made getting Steggy the Stegosaurus to the markets of Minrathath, Labs of Glantry, or Colosseums of Viatus. How you get them there is your problem, because they don't take the teleportation at all. Putting them on a ship requires a lot of food. If it's a meat-eater, the ship's crew might get a little mutinous if there's a mishap en route. Bring a wizard in either case, because you're going to need to keep these things pacified somehow. Charming a T-Rex might keep it from chowing down on you, but you're still going to need to feed it a lot of meat. If you want to unload your dinosaur to a middleman, Minrathad is the place to go. You can also drop them off in Derekin, but you'll have to answer a lot more questions and fill out tons more paperwork. Minrathad is much more understanding, though you will pay a lot in taxes to offload your dinosaur harvest. Unless you're already a member of one of their guilds, and even then you're going to need to be part of the right guild to avoid paying you fees for going outside your specialty. The guilds will then send the dinosaurs to the various buyers, which will be the people you were considering approaching already. The benefit is that Minrathad has turned this into an industry. They already know how to transport the dinos, offload them, what they eat, and everything else the party is probably guessing at. You won't make as much money, but you also won't be dealing with getting in a patasaurus of a mountain range either. The Empire of Thyatis is always looking to buy dinosaurs, and they pay even more for new species. They're infatuated with the creatures, either as monsters in the fighting pits or for a showcase in a private zoo. Various groups openly purchase dinosaurs and other exotic creatures when they appear in ports. And like Minrathad, serve as middlemen. You get less gold for your dinosaurs, but they already have purchasers lined up and have made plans for the transportation. So you aren't dealing with the storage and transport in Thyatis, but you also aren't making as much money. It's a trade-off. Dinosaurs will often be used in the pits. It says that the Emperor personally picks the most impressive species for his games. His weapons from his time as a gladiator have more than a few notches representing victories over various dinos. Glantry, and to a lesser extent Alphacia, use dinosaurs for all sorts of magical experiments. Their use of spell components isn't as great as you think, as they're just a specific type of normal animal. You get a lot more components out of a tiny fire-breathing jerboa than a giant brachiosaur that just stands there and eats plants. But Glantrians, being Glantrians, want to find new ways to make better dinosaurs. Newer dinosaurs. Dinosaurs that will put them over the top in terms of power compared to their rival wizards, or that will just get them an A in their transmutation class. The issue you will have getting dinosaurs to Glantry is that it's really landlocked. That means you'll need to find a way to get an Ankylosaur from Port Athenos to Glantry City. No small task. Alphacia, not being landlocked, doesn't have this problem. If you're going to deal with xenophobic wizards, you're going to need magic. Fortunately, Glantry has lots of that. Unfortunately, they will take the cost of spellcasting out of the agreed payment. Remember to get all agreements in writing before dealing with Glantrians. That's the scoop on dinosaurs in Mastara. It's not unusual for a D&D setting to have dinosaurs, but for Mastara, it's the sheer number of them in certain areas. Isle of Dread is practically fantasy Jurassic Park, 
years before the FX existed to make the movie a reality, and decade before the idea of an island filled with dinosaurs became stale and played out. And yet it still makes a profit. Dinos make for great plot hooks, adventure bait, and possibly even rewards. Who doesn't want a Pachyosaurus as a mount that's given to you for saving an Isle of Dread village? The next topic is a beefy one, dealing with the migration of the elves in the known world. But until next time, Locust? Seriously? That's the best plot you could come up with for the sixth movie? The Land Before Time, The Secret of Saurus Rock had a better plot.